The first reading is from 2 Timothy chapter 4. Um, we're reading from verses 1 to 8, and that's on page uh, 1197 of the Bible. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather round them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. This is the word of the Lord. And let's pray. Father, we praise you for those great truths that we've just um, sung. We have Um, a Savior who is our God. We praise your name um, for that wonderful truth. And Father, I pray now that as I open your word that I would speak boldly and clearly, that your Holy Spirit would use the words um, for your glory. I pray that as we listen, we will listen well, we'll concentrate, but we'll have soft hearts um, so that as we listen to your word, as we listen to the truth, Father, we will be keen to obey it and keen to worship you with our lives. Amen. I would like to buy about three quid's worth of gospel, please. Not too much, uh, just enough to make me happy, but not so much that I get addicted. I would like enough gospel to make my family secure and my children well-behaved, but not so much that I find my ambitions redirected or my giving too greatly enlarged. I would like about three quid's worth of gospel, please. That is from Don Carson's uh, book, Basics for Believers. And it describes the temptation that most of us feel to want to, want to water down the claims, um, the demands, and the impact of the gospel on our lives. We are silent when we should speak because bringing the gospel into a conversation will make relationships with our friends, our family, neighbors, or colleagues very uncomfortable. Or we stay quiet when others volunteer because the need that has to be met will cause too much hassle or busyness in our life. As you look back on 2017, has it been a three quids worth of gospel kind of year for you and your family? Perhaps, praise God, it's actually been a year when you have gone all in. Well, whichever one is most accurate, for you. Um, The great thing about the new year is the chance to forget what is behind and resolve to strain towards what is ahead. So what are the ministers and the staff team at St. John's Riverside and St. Faith's going to do this year to push as many of us as possible away from the three quids worth of gospel life um, and towards living lives that are shaped and driven by the gospel? What great ideas and new strategies have we dreamed up that will bring everyone in the congregation along the road of discipleship? Well, it won't surprise you or it shouldn't surprise you um, to learn that we really only have one plan. We've got one strategy. We've got one idea. In 2018, we resolve once more to preach the word. Now, 2 Timothy, um, it's a letter that Paul wrote to Timothy from prison in Rome. Paul knows he is near to death, and he's got huge concerns. But they're not concerns for his own welfare. 
Rather, he is desperate that the true gospel is guarded carefully so that it can be passed on to the coming generations. Paul gives Timothy in his position as a leader of the church in Ephesus, he gives Timothy a great mission. Here it is in verses 1 and 2. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Preach the word, Timothy. That is the mission that Timothy is to give his life to. And there is no more important task than preaching the word. As Paul surveys his own situation, chained in a cell, deserted by many of his friends and his co-workers, quite close to death, he knows that he is there because he has preached the word. Now, if you've ever watched a bad movie, eaten at a poor restaurant, bought an unreliable car, or dealt with a lazy estate agent, I think there's a few people saying, I've done all four. Um, well, if you've ever done any of them, then you will, you will strongly advise your acquaintances, um, never mind your good friends, to avoid them at all costs. Um, we love warning people away from difficulties. It's something that people like to do. And yet here we have Paul telling Timothy, who is his closest friend, someone he views as a son, really, um, he's telling Timothy to do the same as what he has done and to risk the consequences. Preach the word. Why does he charge Timothy so formally with this difficult and uncomfortable task? Well, we'll look carefully again at verse 1. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. See, the gospel must be carefully guarded and faithfully preached so that people are ready to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Paul lived his whole life expecting Christ's return. He didn't preach to make people's lives better um, or to make them feel more fulfilled or, or more whole. Um, Paul preached because Jesus Christ is coming back, and when he returns, he's returning to judge. And the outcome of that judgment is either eternal life or eternal hell. So we must be ready for that judgment. And it was God's word that Paul preached because nothing else will prepare people for this judgment. One day you will die. One day every one of us here will die unless Jesus Christ returns. And then you will stand before that judgment seat. I have confidence that I'm going to be able to plead Christ's blood at that point. He lived and he died so that my sin was dealt with and, and so that his righteousness was given to me. And there's many of us sitting here who share that same confidence. Why do we have it? Where did we get it from? It's been faithfully preached to us, hasn't it? And God has used that to bring us salvation. There's no more important task than preaching God's word. And there's no time when preaching that word is not the right plan. Timothy is to carry on in season and out of season. Now, as we have driven around Hull over the past few days, my kids keep spotting Christmas lights and Christmas decorations that are still up. And, and they're asking, why are they still up? It's not Christmas anymore. They're doing it with a bit of anger in them. They're a bit disappointed that Christmas is finished. Why is it still up? It's not that season anymore. Well, Timothy, he's to be like those lights that are up all year round, in season and out of season. At times, he's going to be full of enthusiasm for his task. And at other times, he's going to have to drag himself out of bed. At times, those around him are going to soak up the preaching like sponges. And then at other times, all Timothy's going to hear are echoes as it bounces back off rock-hard hearts. He must preach the truth. He must correct people whenever they believe error. He must rebuke people when they play with sin or, or call sin not sin. He must encourage people who are forgetting that Christ has already accomplished everything for them. And he must do it constantly and consistently 
whatever the conditions. There's not going to come a point this year in St. John's um, when we will decide that instead of preaching sermons for a while, we'll simply meet together and meditate in silence for a while on who God is. There's not going to come a time when instead of grappling with the Bible to prepare a sermon, we'll simply put up a famous work of art and expound some great truths from that. Why not? Well, because in season or out of season, it's the preaching of God's Word that makes the eternal difference to people's souls. And there are no circumstances at all um, when this preaching of the Word should be abandoned. Timothy is to do his work with great patience and careful instruction. There are so many brothers and sisters in Christ in these congregations who have soft hearts, who listen to God's word, and with God's help, obey it. I was in on Friday printing out my sermon handouts, and there were two men of the more senior age range in the church setting out all these chairs by themselves. Praise God for hearts that are convinced we should serve one another. But you know what? There's a few as well amongst us who, instead of employing great patience and careful instruction with, I would love to instead employ the tactics of the rugby coach in the school I went to. He hadn't really heard of great patience and careful instruction. Um, he sort of firmly believed in the more old-fashioned shake and shout method <laughs> until you did what he wanted you to do. You see, with those who are hit and miss in coming to church and, and those who don't really see the need to give financially, with, with those who don't really consider coming to pray with others, shouting is not going to work. Great patience and careful instruction are required, both of which mean real time. And when you think about the size of this congregation, suddenly you see why a team of really good home group leaders um, are required if we're going to take that instruction really seriously. Now, there are times we want to think, what else might work? So with the primetime events up at Riverside, that's uh, with the seniors' work, there's a whole lot of work going in to ensure that the gospel is shared with as many seniors as possible. If we're not getting through to them, should we change our approach? Well, I think Paul would have us change anything we want to change, as long as the preaching of the word is not changed. There are no circumstances when the preaching of the word can be abandoned. Why does it, though, have to be such a solemn charge um, from Paul to Timothy and these last instructions that he's going to give him? Well, it's because this mission um, means a very, very difficult battle. There it is in verses 3 to 5. As Timothy carries on preaching the gospel, there are going to be those people who prefer to hear something else. And in these verses, we see that these people have got real problems with their ears. Their ears are very itchy and sound doctrine just won't scratch them. And their ears are pointed in the wrong direction so that the truth can never reach them. Do we live in those times now? We could pick any of the doctrines, but let's take the doctrine of hell. Um, here's what a, a writer called Dorothy Sayre said about this back in the 1930s and the 1940s. This is what she said. She said, there seems to be a kind of conspiracy, especially among middle-aged writers of vaguely liberal tendency, to forget or conceal where the doctrine of hell comes from. But the doctrine of hell is not medieval. It is Christ's. One cannot get rid of it without tearing the New Testament to tatters. We cannot repudiate hell without altogether repudiating Christ. Now, that was 80 years ago. It sounds very modern, doesn't it? The exact same thing has happened with the doctrine of marriage in our day. We are in a battle to proclaim the truth when many just do not want to hear it. Three quid's worth of gospel is so much more comfortable where you can keep Jesus but get rid of hell and do away with any constraints on your behavior or your sexuality. Many, many leaders are now teaching these sort of things. They are teaching something else 
That is not God's word. Just like Paul says, there are a great number of teachers saying what their itching ears want to hear. I watched a few YouTube clips over New Year, um, not just greatest goals and stuff like that. I watched a few YouTube clips, um, and I listened carefully to what some of the most senior leaders in the Church of England were saying publicly. Now, in truth, they were saying more public things about education or politics than they were about the gospel, but I did find some where the gospel was spoken of. And you know, in those clips, loads of what they said sounded really good, really traditional, and really faithful to what the church has been teaching for hundreds of years. But it was what was not said that actually stood out. For example, the word sin was not used in any of the clips that I watched. Rather, people needed help following poor decisions that they might have made. That's what they needed Jesus for. Now, that might not sound huge, but remember the seriousness of the charge that Paul was giving Timothy. The word is to be faithfully preached because only the word can prepare people for judgment. Martin Luther wrote this. You'll have to listen carefully to this one, but it's good. Martin Luther wrote this. He he wrote, if I profess with the loudest voice and the clearest exposition every portion of the truth of God, except precisely that little point that the world and the devil are at that moment attacking, I am not confessing Christ, no matter how boldly I may be professing Christ. Wherever the battle rages, it's there the loyalty of the soldier is proved. And to be steady on the battlefield, besides, is mere flight and disgrace if he flinches at that one point. See, people don't want to hear about sin. Their ears point more towards politics than theology. Their ears are more itchy for comfort and not challenge. Will we stop preaching that people are sinners whose biggest need is forgiveness and whose offense required the Son of God to be slain on a cross? Will we use other words that don't sound quite as fanatical? Will we take the easy route and preach myths instead? Well, by God's grace, we in this place won't. With his help, we will keep our heads, carry on with the mission, do the work of evangelists, and discharge all the duties faithfully. The big question is, are we in this place together on that Please be together on that because there is a crown in store for those who are part of this great battle. In verses 6 to 8, Paul is already tasting victory. Now, maybe it's because I have a Scottish wife, or maybe it's just because I love bad accents, um, but I'm a big fan of the movie Braveheart. Um, in that, uh, some terrible accents in that, anyway... Um, Andy Kelsey could teach them how to do it. Anyway, in, in, in that film, there's a huge battle scene where everything is chaos, swords, screams, yells, just carnage everywhere you look. But suddenly, everything goes quiet. And the camera swings to a blood-covered Mel Gibson, and he pauses to take a few breaths as he realizes the battle is one. And then the next breath is a mighty shout of victory, which I'm not going to do. (laughs) We see in that little dank prison cell where others facing the same fate would have been absolutely broken and self-pitying, Paul takes a few breaths and he realizes his battle has been won and his work is over. He has fought the fight. He has finished the race, and he can almost touch the reward. Paul knows where he has come from. The worst of sinners who persecuted the church, transformed by the grace of God into a servant of Christ who longs for his return. Three quids of of gospel would never have been enough for Paul. He wanted everything that was on offer, all the suffering and all the glory. And how glorious it's going to be to receive a crown of righteousness 
from the hand of Jesus rather than hearing the bang of a judge's gavel. The crown is a crown that belongs to all who long for his return. Does that concern you at all? But it does me sometimes when I look at my desires and, and my longings and, and realize that so many of them are tied up with my comfort here on earth. How do we learn to long for his return more and more? I think we just follow Paul's example. We accept the mission, we fight in the battle, and we realize that our tastes are being changed. We, we are being transformed. We want more of what Jesus has to offer and less of what the world does. This really matters because each crown fits one person and one person only. Paul has always had a deep love and care for God's people. He's always had a burning passion to evangelize. But at that moment in his cell, shortly before his death, whether or not people responded to his message is almost irrelevant. Because at that moment, all that will matter for each one of us um, is whether or not we have carried out our mission, whether or not we have fought faithfully in the battle. So the leaders here at St. John's resolve to accept Timothy's mission to preach the word. We, we resolve to fight the battles that this will bring. We resolve to aim for that crown of righteousness that is on offer to those people who are longing for Christ's return. Will we all here make the same resolutions? But what is the opposite of settling for three quid's worth of gospel? Well, in another of Paul's letters, written from an earlier prison cell, I think we have the answer. And Tom read Philippians 1 to us earlier. Well, here's verses 3 to 6 again. I thank God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. I think the opposite of three quids worth of gospel is partnership in the gospel. So some of us here need to make some old New Year's resolutions. You have already been partnering, praise God. The minister's mission is your mission. The minister's battle is your battle. The minister's victory is your victory. Praise God, I thank him for your partnership in the gospel. So this year, keep going, keep fighting the battle, and, and you will long more and more for his return. And some of us here need to make new New Year's resolutions. You maybe haven't been partnering, just kind of spectating. If this is a, a battle and there's a recruitment drive, you've found the reasons to stay at home, but there are no good reasons to say no to this mission. The start of a new year is a fantastic time to sign up for the mission, to begin the battle, and to look forward to the victory that Christ has already won for his people. Let's pray. Father, we praise your name that you have not left us alone. We praise your name that you have revealed yourself to us in your Son, you have bought us at a great, great price, and you've given us your word, and you've commanded us um, to preach your word, and you've commanded us to obey your word. And so, Father, I pray that this year, in 2018, we will be a church known for um, its acceptance of your word, its submission to your word, its joyful delight in your word. And I pray that you will grow us together in this great mission so that together we will be looking forward um, to that day when you hand each one of us the crown of righteousness. We praise your name that you do all these things for your name and for your glory. Amen.